so fundraising is a really, really interesting beast. And this is one of the areas we help a lot of people with because there's a lot of bad advice we've been given around how to pitch. And, and, and the thing is, when it comes to the pitch, we've all been taught to lead with confidence. But what often happens is we present with false certainty. And when you present with false certainty, you're inviting your investors, the people you're pitching. It's like, it's like uh, think, of, think of the game of Jenga, right, where you've got this pyramid of stacks of pieces, and all they need to do is pull out one piece on the bottom, and the entire tower comes falling down. So this is the danger when we present false certainty about, let's be honest, if you're a startup raising money, it's full of speculation. So how do you present what is a speculative promise of the future, but do it in a way that has integrity, in a way that gets your investors on your side, that gets them to give you the benefit of the doubt? So we have a few strategies around this. Uh, one of the first ones, we call it the 90% test which is in the first two minutes of your pitch, you need to get 90% of the room on your side. Now, that might sound like common sense, but remember, if you're an entrepreneur, odds are you're coming in and disrupting your industry. You have a premise that's a paradigm shift. You're turning things upside down. But you gotta be careful about how you frame and tell that story, because if you come in saying, look, everything about this industry is wrong, right? And I've got the answer as to how to make it right. You're putting your audience on the defensive, especially if your investors already know something about that industry. So a lot of what you want to be looking at in your pitch, it, we, we call it, um, we have a model for this. It's, uh, the model for this is called C, C-E-E, -E, because you have to see it in order to believe it. So um, C-E-E -E stands for context, emotion, and evidence. See, where a lot of us have been thrown off is we've all been taught to, to lead with the data. If you start with the data, if you start with the numbers, your story's dead on arrival because those numbers don't mean anything to anybody. And we all know that any of us can present facts and evidence to support any position we want. Right? What we have to do is we have to give people the right context and the right emotional content for that evidence to make sense. What does that mean? So context. Uh, think about it this way. How are you setting the table? And uh, instead of leading with the problem, which puts people on the defensive, start with the opportunity. A couple ways you can do this. Here's three ways you can do this. Imagine if, right? Imagine if we had a way where people could get real-time data to make better decisions in how they're treating their patients. Like imagine if, Right, so imagine if is a really powerful opening statement that gets people into the imaginal state. Uh, another way to do this would be to open with, um, I'm really excited about, and then describe something that we can do today that we couldn't do five or 10 years ago. Maybe it's a new technology, maybe it's a new economic sort of climate, maybe it's a certain cultural value or, or social, um, social shift that people want more of something, okay? So you wanna, you wanna open with context, which is help people see how change leads to new possibilities. Once you've set that table, then what you wanna do is you wanna talk about emotion. And you wanna really drill down into a character who's at the center of the story, and what do they want, and what gets in their way. So what's the want, and what's the obstacle? Or another way to say it, what's the desire and what's the dilemma? Uh, you know, we have a client that we've been working with that's in the artificial intelligence category. And they have a solution for VPs of customer support. Now, if you're a VP of customer support right now, your day-to-day -day reality is a big, giant pile of suck. All right? Because what are you asked for? You're asked to have increased ticket volume at a lower cost and you're not allowed to compromise on customer happiness. You're screwed, right? How the heck do you deliver on that, right? It's, it's a lose-lose proposition. And now artificial intelligence is coming along saying, look, we're gonna automate even more of how customer service is done and somehow that that's gonna improve customer happiness. So you got VPs of customer support that are freaked out. And AI, even though there's great promise to it, 
there's a lot of risk as to how that's going to screw things up. So, you know, there's a desire that they have. Their desire is, we, we, you know, we're, we want to humanize. We want to, we want to, we want to pers- personalize the experience. We want our customers to really know we care, but we need to lower our costs. We need to streamline our operations. So that's the dilemma that a VP of customer support faces, right? So you want to, you want to really dial into what is it people want more of and what gets in their way. So if you have proper context and proper emotional connection, if you set the table right that way and you have people leaning in and identifying in the story, they'll be begging for the evidence that it's true. They'll be just waiting for, please just give me some shred of facts and data to support this premise because I'm bought in. I love the dream. I love the possibility. And you see this on Shark Tank. You see this when somebody comes in where they have a story worth telling, like the premise of what they're doing at its core is so good, even though they might not be the most sophisticated business person yet, or they might not have their business model completely figured out. If you're able to capture the imagination and you get people to feel something, they're going to want to go on the journey with you, All right? So, so that's the shift. Um, but it, you know, it's not what any of us have been taught. We've all been taught to come in there full guns blaring. Let me tell you what's wrong with the world, but don't worry, I have the answer. And you're setting yourself up. There's only one direction that story can go when you set yourself up on such a high pedestal, right? Is the story's going to go down. And you're inviting investors to get adversarial. You're inviting people to basically poke holes in in your narrative. Um, So we're constantly looking at how do we put people in a more receptive state? How do we get people to give us the benefit of the doubt? You know, how do we get people to emotionally identify and relate to get bought into the premise of the story? Because you'll be amazed at how much more uh, forgiving uh, and supportive people will become in the process.